Welcome back. This is Castlin and Always Acting Up. This is the podcast where I will be sharing all of my personal stories and journeys as an actress in the entertainment industry. You'll learn a couple tips and tricks along the way. You'll learn some things of what to do and what not to do. In this episode, I'm excited. I have another special guest. He is not only an actor, but he is a YouTube star. I'm going to call him Mr. YouTube, and he's going to be joining us here in just a second. And before we get into that, I want to give a very special shout out to everyone who's been supporting on this podcast. You guys have been fantastic following along on my Instagram page, always acting up. And of course, this could not be done without you. So I'm going to give a quick round of applause. Thank you guys for following. And like I mentioned, I do have a special guest here today. He has been in Marvel's Black Widow. He's been in uh, Cobra Kai Dynasty. Debbie Ryan is insatiable. And like I said, I am calling him the king of YouTube. Welcome, Kurt Yua. Did I say it right? <laughs> you did. Thank you, Kaslyn. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. I'm super happy to be here. And happy to hang out with you and all your listeners and your uh, other past guests. Um, I don't know about I don't know about King of YouTube. I mean, YouTube. There are YouTubers with tens of millions of followers. So yeah. So uh, well, I wanted to talk about that also um, because anytime I go onto YouTube and I type in acting or mm -hmm. actor, it's always you. So I was like, Kurt's like the guy to talk to. So I definitely want to talk to you about YouTube and and how that came about in just a second, yeah, but I did, it. I did want to mention, uh, or talk about, so you're an actor and where are you based right now? I'm based out of Atlanta, Georgia. I moved here about five years ago from Cleveland, Ohio. And were you acting when you were in Cleveland, Ohio? Yeah, that's actually where I got my start. So I, um, it's kind of a funny story. So I started my acting career well, I guess you could say I started my acting career when I was in fourth grade, when I did my mandatory fourth grade play. But uh, between then and the age of 26, I didn't do any acting. So I, I guess um, I didn't really start until I was uh, 26 years old. I was already working in the corporate world uh, as a software developer, and which is how most actors start, right? And then mm -hmm. I, uh, and then I started taking an acting class after work because I was looking for something fun to do after work. I wasn't really looking to like become an actor. It was just looking for something that wasn't like going to happy hours and getting drinks with friends. So we were, so me and uh, one of my good buddies, we were looking for something to do, having to find this acting class, and that's that's when it started. So that was back in two thousand eight. And, uh, and it just kind of like slowly grew from there. Like I started taking the classes and then after about a year, uh, one of the, uh, one of my classmates recommended me to her agent her lo you know, a local agent in Cleveland, Ohio. We did mo mostly like local commercials and corporate training videos and that type of stuff. So I started doing a little bit of acting that way while I was still working my nine to five. So if I booked something, I would just take a day off work and stuff like that and just slowly kind of grew uh, to the point where, you know, then I, five years ago, I made the decision to move down to Atlanta. Was there, um, because you're that, Ohio is sort of like a smaller regional market as well. Did you find that there was fairly consistent work being in, you know, Ohio? Um, Ohio, Cleveland specifically is a pretty, is in a pretty lo good location in that you have the Cleveland area, but then within like a five to six hour drive, you have Detroit, Columbus, Pittsburgh, uh, Buffalo, Rochester, Cincinnati, Indianapolis. Like you have all these other like bigger cities mm -hmm. that, you know, none of them really have any film and television stuff going on, but all of them have local commercials and corporate videos and things like that for their particular cities. So if you kind of combine all of those markets, then yeah, there, there was a good amount of work if you're willing to travel for some of those, uh, mm. for some of those gigs. And then like Cincinnati, especially. So Cincinnati is about four to five hours away from Cleveland. Uh, Procter and Gamble is based in Cincinnati. So you get all those big brands Ooh. that are there that are shooting uh, commercials and corporate videos for their companies. So there was a lot going on in Cincinnati as well. So, yeah, because I always talk about the smaller markets. I feel like 
what I did is I I could not wait to get out to LA. And so I, 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 I jetted out here like right away without having any experience, no reels, no headshots, nothing. And I, now that I know what it's like being in a smaller market, I'm always trying to tell people like, stay where you are just for a little bit, uh, train, get your materials. And then once you feel comfortable, once you actually know the business and know what you're doing, then head out to a bigger market. And so that's what you were able to do. Essentially, you were able to you know, I, I bet you probably had your reels and everything before you went down to Atlanta. Yeah, hundred percent. And and part of it though, I think is like, if I were, if I were in your shoes and I grew up, um, like if, if, if I were someone who grew up like dreaming about dreaming about acting, then I probably would have done the same thing. Like, all right, well, Hollywood's the way to go or, mm-hmm. or New York or Broadway is the way to go. Right. And just immediately try to do that. But like, uh, luckily or unluckily, or, or however it just worked out for me, like that wasn't my, you know, that wasn't my dream growing up. So I never had the desire to move out to Hollywood. So I just kind of by default started in the small market and was like, okay, well, this is just how it, how, this is how it's going to go. Um, and uh, and even after a while, even after I had some success. Uh, working on like commercials and some things like that in Ohio, I still never had the desire to go out to LA because after a few years of being in the acting business and meeting other actors and seeing some of my friends that had moved out to LA and seeing how, how they're struggling and it's just so hard, it's super saturated with actors and so expensive to live out there, mm-hmm. right? All this stuff that I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but yeah. uh <laughs> So I see all of that and I'm like, well, that's not really what I want. And uh, it took, and I was also naive to the other markets such as Atlanta. And it took meeting a couple of people who were actors from Atlanta to tell me about it for me to actually research it and look into it. And then eventually decide to actually try to come down here and, and do I'm going down here. But to answer your question, yeah, when I came down, I did have like a solid demo reel, but it was, you know, it was mainly commercial stuff. Um, mm. So I had a commercial, a strong commercial demo reel, not too much film and TV because there really just wasn't much um, other than like little indie projects. But um, one of the benefits of coming down to Atlanta with a strong commercial demo demo reel um, that would be different than going to like a New York or an LA is that Atlanta still, you know, it's grown to be pretty big, but it's still very much um, kind of a smaller market in the sense that you don't have a million agencies out here and the agencies Mm. aren't all separated. So almost every agency you you would sign with would rep you across the board. Whereas Uh. in LA, first you get a commercial agent, then you have to separately try to find a theatrical agent. Right. So the way that I got my agent here in Atlanta was I had a strong commercial demo reel. The commercial department of my agency was what uh, is who I caught the eye of. Right. But because Mm -hmm. they signed me and they rep people for everything, then so they assigned me across the board. So I just happened to get a theatrical agent through that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was another benefit of coming to a market like Atlanta in that I didn't necessarily have to have a, you know, a bunch of film and television credits in order to get that film and TV agent. Now that's starting to change because that was like five years ago. And now it's already like Atlanta's already grown exponentially since then. Um, but, uh, but I still think it is the case where it's a little bit easier to kind of get your, get the ball rolling in, in Atlanta than it is in LA and New York still. Yeah. Kurt, I, I find your story absolutely fascinating because, you know, I was watching a lot of your videos and I'm going to do some air quotes for you guys who are just listening, but Kurt started like later in life. You were still in like your mid, your mid twenties, but there's just this idea of if you start after 18 or in your, even in like your early twenties, you're, you're too late. You're too old. You know, you're competing with all these child actors who are now adults. And, you know, I, I was, I was told I was old the first time when I was 24, I was, it was too late. I was never gonna have a career. And I was 24 years old. And I'm like, this is insane, but I actually wish that I would have done it the way you did because you, you kind of did it opposite of what most people did. And so you were able to establish a career and a job. So you were able to afford yourself classes and headshots or the ability to do whatever you needed to do. Whereas most of us, we don't really have that ability. And that's what I think is fascinating. And 
has that has that been what's really helped you in your career with your I mean, yes, financially, but also I, I would feel like just everything would be just a little bit easier, a little bit more relaxed because you're not dependent on the job. Yeah, when I look back on it, I'm super grateful for starting the way that I did. And I think it's, yeah, I agree with you. I think it absolutely is a contributing factor, um, probably one of the, the biggest factors. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, through my YouTube channel, I get a lot of uh, people asking questions in the comments. And I get one of the most common questions, honestly, that I get is like, oh, is it too late for me to start? And the people that are asking that, the range of ages is crazy. Mm -hmm. Um there are people that are like 12, you know, there's, there are people, Hey, I'm 12 years old. I've never taken any acting classes. Is it too late for me? You know? No. And then, and then there's, yeah. And then there's absolutely people in their late teens, twenties, thirties. Um, I, I tell people that. So, uh, one of my, actually I knew two people here in Atlanta who started after they retired from their original careers um, one guy I know worked for the CDC, uh, for his entire life and then retired. And, uh, another guy worked as a high, uh, high school teacher and retired. And both of them are in their, they started in their sixties mm -hmm. and bo they're both working. They're both booking movies and TV shows now. Um, so it, it's, uh, there's actually, there's absolutely no, uh, age limit or, or, you know, high age limit to start your career. As far yeah. as, as far as I go, you know, I definitely see the advantages of starting uh, later rather than earlier. Number one, I mean, you kind of start with uh, a little bit more life experience. And we all know from yes. an acting standpoint, you know, you can connect a lot more with with the subject matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you're when you're younger and you're reading these scripts and you're like, OK, well, I, I kind of have to pretend to do, to, to feel such and such emotion. Cause I've never experienced this particular thing before. Whereas, you know, when you're a little bit older, you can absolutely connect with a lot, a lot more stuff and you can draw upon your life experiences to, to help, um, in, inform your acting choices. And then, um, you know, you also kind of don't have those, uh, younger delusional expectations of what oh an God. acting career should be right. Of like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to start and then like three years from now, I'm going to be, be the lead in my first movie. And then five years from now, I'm going to win my Oscar. And then what, everything's going to be gravy from that on. And, and, you know, when you're a little bit older, you kind of understand how life works in general. And, uh, and then of course the industry as a whole. And so you kind of, uh, you can kind of sit back and not play the comparison game quite as much and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and just be more along for the ride and, and enjoy the process a little bit more. Whereas, I feel like younger people to tell younger people to enjoy the process is uh, is really hard because they're like, yeah, but I want it now, right? But I yeah. want to succeed now. It's so true because I I've had this conversation with uh, myself and some of my other people who are just starting. I think every single actor, myself, new, younger, older, I think every single actor prances into LA thinking that yeah, it's going to be a couple of years and then I'm going to get my series regular and then I'm going to be um, consistently working and it's going to be not easy, but it's it's going to happen for me. I think every single person thinks that way and maybe it works for Ashton Kutcher. I don't know, whatever, whatever the case may be, but for most of us, it's going to be a little bit longer of a process, but I thought that was funny because I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I thought when I was 17. I thought I was going to be a couple auditions in and maybe a year or so I'll get my first, my first acting job. And then I will be a series regular guest star, whatever. And turns out I didn't even know how to get headshots done. I didn't know anything <laughs> yeah. about it. So yeah, it's a little bit longer of a process than most of us think. And yeah, that's and why I think what it is. Uh, I mean, part of it is that um, at whatever age that we are, we'll compare ourselves to other people of that age. So whether we're 12 years old or 18 years old or 25 or 35 or whatever, you're always looking at other people that are that age. And, and, at, and this is one of those careers that at any age you could see successful people, right? It's not necessarily like other, it's not like you can be a successful doctor when you're eight, but you right. can be a successful actor when you're eight. Right. So, so that's the it. interesting thing of like, you have, you can be a young, young kid and see, Oh, well that person is successful at my age. If I'm not super successful by next year, then I'm way, be, I'm far behind. 
Mm. Right. And that's, that's that comparison stuff. That's, that's hard to kind of get out of our minds. It's the worst. Um, especially, yeah, especially when we're younger. Yeah. And you know what? Also, um, for you guys listening. So my boyfriend is actually a filmmaker as well. And we have a really hard time, uh, casting moms, dads, and, you know, grandparents in, and I think that's what most people think of like, oh, I haven't started by, you know, I'm not successful by X, Y, Z, and then they stop. But actually, like, we really need you because there's not as many people. So if you're thinking like, uh, it's too old, it's too late to start. It's it's not like we really we need you. We need green grandparents. We need older characters. We need mature actors. And I, I think if you start now, it's going to be a really good opportunity because there's not as many of you like we need you like we're looking for you. And we're having a really hard time finding um, an older mom character for one of our projects. So I'm like, oh, I wonder what that's what that's about. And I guess that's what the case is, is we feel like we're too old to start where I think that's the industry thing, though, too. I think the industry puts this crazy thing in most people's head. Yeah, I so. think, definitely think that is that's part of it as well. And hopefully, hopefully some people listening are hearing that and saying, hey, I want to audition for your project because it, that role fits me perfectly. Yeah, because we need it. And so now that you, I, you know what I really like the idea? I also wanted to say how you and your friend, when you were starting acting classes, you're like, we don't want to go to happy hour. Like, we didn't want to do something like that. So you... <laughs> You had an acting yeah. class. What was it that made you go, ah, oh, an acting class may be fun? Was it an improv class? Like what actually sparked that idea as opposed to uh happy hour? Because I probably would have said rock climbing or something, but sure. an acting class. Well, I did I was already rock climbing at the time. Yeah. So I enjoyed okay. that. My other friend was definitely not a rock climber type. So he didn't he didn't want to do that. But um we weren't we we didn't like necessarily we weren't like brainstorming and and then like came up with acting classes what what it was we were actually leaving a bar and mm. uh we happened to walk by a little a little uh storefront acting class uh on the same street of the bar that we w- we would happen to be leaving at like 2 a.m and uh they obviously weren't having classes at 2 a.m but they had a sign in the window that says it's an acting class your first class is free just email us to uh to ask ask about it so Jotted wow. down the email address, and uh, the next week, I just uh, walked into uh, the first class just to check it out. And honestly, for a long time, for like the first year, it was I was just in the class because I enjoyed it. Like I had no desire to try to get an agent or anything like that. I just like mm. loved going to that going to that class because it was so much fun. And uh, it was it was a Meisner based class. Um, so there was a lot of like yelling and screaming, <laughs> but, uh, and it was, you know, but it was just so different from my nine to five in the cubicle yeah. as a software developer. So like once or twice a week to pop into there and to like do this crazy acting stuff was, uh, was just a blast. Is your, is your friend still acting? Cause you said you started with your friend. He's not. And he honestly didn't even start it because of acting. He was a big movie buff, but he was much more interested in like writing. Mm. Um, so he still like writes his own little short films and things like that. Uh, so that cool. definitely can. And, and when we started, it was a cool thing because that's when we got introduced to things like the 48 hour film project. Mm-hmm. So him mm-hmm. as the writer director mind you know, he wanted to do that side of things. And then I was like, okay, well, I'll be your actor for it. And so we got to do like that, you know, things like that. Um, whereas prior, prior to that, we were just, you know, interested in movies as fans of watching them. Right. So, uh, acting yeah. that, that class definitely introduced both of us to, you know, things that we could add to our lives. Yeah. How did you eventually w- decide to get representation and start doing commercials? Somebody in your class had to have been like, you know, you're really good at this. You should. Yeah, you should and I think uh, people have have re- had recommended it to me prior uh, than than after a year, but I just I was like, no, nah, I'm just I don't know, um, I'm just kind of doing it for fun or whatever. And then one time, one of my classmates said, my agent is specifically looking for an Asian male for a role like right mm. now they need a, they need someone to audition for it right now 
like, would you like to audition? I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, that if you're just like, if you really need like just specifically this role, I'll do it. And I, so I went into the agency's office to audition. I didn't get that part, but they were like, look, we, we liked your audition. So why don't we, you know, why don't you sign with us and we'll start sending you other auditions. So, I mean, it was kind of like, it just fell, fell into my lap, right? Um, which is not everybody's story. Most people are actually trying to go out there and yeah. seek an agency. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people also, especially, again, especially younger actors are also searching for, or trying to get representation uh, oftentimes too early. Oftentimes, like without any experience, they're like, right, let me get an agent right away. Um, yeah. and they just don't have the experience or the or um, the training or anything like that for it. Whereas I had already done training for like a year uh, in classes, albeit I was kind of just doing it for fun, but I also, you know, I was learning from it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I started with the agency kind of that way and would just go, would just like do auditions on my lunch hour. Uh, Cause I, that was when, you know, that was before we were self-taping anything. So I would, and because I was uh, working my nine to five, I would leave for lunch and go to my agency's office and self take because in a smaller, smaller markets rarely have casting directors. So the agent kind of plays both roles. So the agents often will have a little taping room uh, at their offices. So I would go in and tape an audition. And then if I booked something, I would just take a day off work and go do the little training video or something and then go, go back to work the next day. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned something which I kind of wanted to talk about. Um, being an Asian actor, Asian male, and you don't see a lot of Asian males or Asians in general on TV at all. But I, I do feel and I hope that coming in the future, there's a lot more opportunities for Asians. Um, I'm going to do a quick plug real fast. You guys, if you haven't seen Takeout Girl, it's an all Asian cast. And that's going to be airing on Hulu, releasing uh, this month, actually. So make sure to check out that. And that is, I sorry, the reason I was talking about that is the producer of this podcast, Hassani Johnson, is the director of Takeout Girls. So oh, there no. you go. Um, so back with the more opportunities, have you realized or has there been more opportunities for Asian actors, Asian males, um, now that we are actually starting to recognize the lack of diversity in, in TV and film? So I think... In the past few years, what I may, I think I've seen more and more uh, breakdowns that specifically say Asian. Um, mm -hmm. I have been getting fairly consistently uh, auditions since coming to Atlanta anyway, but for the most part, the parts that I would read for were, would just be open ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. Would just be a character that would be open ethnicity that anybody could audition for. Um, and oftentimes if you, I, I feel like if we're reading between the lines, it probably just means non-white when it's yeah. open ethnicity, <laughs> but, um, so I would definitely get those breakdowns, but now I do feel like I'm seeing more and more specifically Asian characters that are written and, and probably within the last year or so, maybe bigger roles that are Asian, like maybe in the, in, like two or three years ago, I would start seeing some Asian co-stars, right? But now we'll start to see a few more Asian, specifically Asian guest stars, maybe some specifically Asian series regulars. But that also could be the fact that I have now been in Atlanta for five years and been working the market for five years. And I'm, now I'm starting to see those. So maybe those opportunities were there a few years ago. I just hadn't you know, grown enough in this market to see them yet. But um, but either way, I am starting to see uh, a few more um, breakdowns that, that are specifically targeting Asian actors. Good, because I, I think that yeah, needs... it's great to see. Yeah, I think I think that needs to happen. And I, I really, really want to get into YouTube because I have you had a really big opportunity recently, and I need to see how that came. So I'm going to do a sure. quick little transition us here, and so. Like I, I, I was calling you Mr. YouTube at the beginning because as I was saying, anytime I go into YouTube, uh, I type in the word acting, actor, or something like that, one of your videos pops up. So do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what your channel is called? Because you cover a lot of different topics. So can you want to tell us about that a little bit? Sure. And I can kind of go back into the um, history of it too, because mm -hmm. I started my YouTube channel 
when I was still in Cleveland. And at the oh. time, it was called Small Market Actor because okay. I had, you know, I started just like everybody else. I was researching acting stuff all over, you know, on the internet and then on YouTube. And then mm-hmm. on YouTube, I think at the time, back in like 2012, 2013, um, like at the time, there was really only one person talking about acting on YouTube, and that was Amy Jo Berman. And uh, right. I don't know if you know her. So she was a uh, former casting of, at HBO. So she mm-hmm. has some pretty big credentials um, and was definitely like a Hollywood person. Like she knew all about casting and acting and the industry and stuff like that in Hollywood. Definitely knew what she was talking about, but her information did not necessarily translate to Cleveland, Ohio, right? How to, right. How to do local commercials and corporate videos and things like that, like how to get started in like that type of market. It didn't necessarily translate. So I was like, oh, maybe there's an opportunity here to talk about um, how to start in a little, in a smaller market. Um, so that's how I got, that's how I started it, but I was not consistent at all at that time. Like I'm, I had, was making like two videos a year. So I I was just, I I made a few videos, but I just like kind of fell off the map of doing it. I wasn't really uh, consistent with it until I moved to Atlanta. And then when I was in Atlanta and I started booking movies and TV shows, I always had in the back of my head, I was like, I think I should start making YouTube videos again because I have more information to share now, Um, especially on the movie and TV stuff, which is what most people are interested in anyway. it was always in the back of my head, but I never got it rolling again until 2020. And then we had nothing to do and we were just sitting at home. And I, that's when I started it again. So that's when I rebranded it to the Acting Career Center uh, from mm-hmm. Small Market Actor. And uh, my first video that I made then was about how my career has changed since moving to Atlanta, right? So I started talking about Atlanta and the film industry here. And then from then on, I was making consistently about one video a week. Sometimes I would take like a week or two off, but um, I've still been pretty consistent in doing that. And, uh, mm-hmm. and yeah, it's been growing pretty well since, uh, since starting it back up. Then the cool thing though, is that a couple of my videos way back in like 2014, 2015, when I first started it, they had been slowly, you know, growing over time and getting views over time. So I was getting a handful of subscribers here and there for the past five years. So that by the time I did start again in 2020, there was a small, a few thousand already, kind of a small subscriber base there. But in the, in the like year since then, it's grown exponentially. It's gone all up to Right now, I think it's over 90,000. It's going to hit 100,000 100, pretty soon, maybe next Yeah, I, I was looking at your your posts in the community section on YouTube. You went from, listen to this, you guys. In one year, he went from 10,000 subscribers to 50,000 subscribers to 90,000 subscribers. <laughs> this is yeah. insane. Like, it's been growing that's pretty, fantastic. pretty, it's been pretty wild, yeah. Did you target like um, SEO or how did you grow so quickly? Like, did you know exactly what types of videos to make and what people were searching for? Was this strategic? Like how did Uh, this happen? Yes and no. Like part of it, I I did research like that type of stuff. Part, you know, part of me coming from a tech background, right? I, I, I'm, uh, you know, nerd out about that type of stuff a little bit, but at the same time, I also don't, um, I also don't go crazy about it because you can easily fall into just like trying to perfect every tiny little SEO item of every video. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are things that I could be doing that I definitely don't do uh, just because I, for me, it's too tedious and it's not really, I don't really enjoy putting that much time into certain aspects of my videos. But, um, but yeah, I definitely do like making, making the, uh, eye-catching thumbnails and the titles and I do research the titles like I'll, I'll research what um, what videos are being searched and what videos are being watched like one thing for people that are trying to start YouTube channels I'll just I mean I'll I'll, I'll um, use acting as an example because mm-hmm. I have friends that have asked me about this and are interested in starting their own YouTube channel because I think it's great 
I think it's a great thing for all actors to do because it mm-hmm. gives us another creative outlet for, you know, when we're not on set, because most of the yeah. time we're not, right? Yeah. Most of the time we're not going to be uh, working on a, on a major set. So if we can find another way to kind of be creative and create our own content, um, I think YouTube is a great way to do it. And um, so I have some friends that have been starting YouTube channels and I, this is what I tell them. I say, if you, especially if you want to make it about acting, if you want to do what I'm doing and share, because I think if we need that, we need more people sharing their experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely give a ton of advice on my channel, but that's all coming from my personal experience. You're going to have, right. You're going to have different experiences than me. And then somebody else is going to have different experiences than the two of us. So I think it's really important to hear from a lot of voices out there and a lot of people. And I, I would say, just go to my channel, go to my videos. You can sort it by most views. And then there you could, that, that basically gives you an outline of what people want to watch. Right. That gives you an outline of the topics that people are searching for and, and that people uh, want to see. And then so, hey, just copy it, copy what I'm doing, make videos on those topics. Um, it's not really like competition. You're just talking about the same topic, but from a different point of view. And people will want to people are going to watch mine and people are going to watch yours, too. So yeah. that's what people do on YouTube anyways. They just exactly recreate and change it up a little bit. Everybody else's videos. Yeah. And then you just capitalize sort of and build and build and build and build. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's kind of how I started. I looked up uh, Amy Jo Berman, for instance. I looked up her channel. I found, you know, all her successful videos and I did my versions of a handful of them. And then I stopped. I mean, after a while, I was like, okay, well, I I know what I'm doing now. I I, can kind of get a feel for it. After you get a, a, a handful of videos, and especially if people start watching, then they start to ask questions. And then you're like, okay. Well, if one person's asking a question about this topic, then probably more people want to know about it too. Let me make a video about this topic and that topic. And then, and then at this point, I mean, I have a little uh, Google spreadsheet of uh, video ideas. And at, at the beginning, I was like, How, there's no way I'm going to be able to sustain like six months of, you know, of mm-hmm. content. But then after just like getting started and then brainstorming more ideas and then the questions start coming in and then it's like wow okay I got plenty and I still got you know uh, probably a hundred things on that spreadsheet that that I could do videos on right now I thought that too about this podcast I was like yeah I have a couple things I want to talk about and then I'm like I think I'm gonna be done but the more (laughs) I keep going the more I'm like oh we should talk about this or I'd love to talk to this guest about xyz and you know what I think I think that you being I'm doing air quotes again an adult as opposed to maybe younger, I would have never thought to look at somebody else's YouTube to see what their most popular videos are. And then, and then branch upon that. I don't think I would have thought about that if I were younger. Actually, I I don't didn't think about it now. But (laughs) I think think you having your career in you got your degree in computer science. So I think using your business savvy was a, a great start for you. And I also want to, I know I talk about SEO and sometimes people are like, what in the world is SEO? You guys, SEO is your search engine optimization. And basically what you want to do just to kind of give you a brief summary is use specific keywords. So like, say for example, uh, you have a website. If your website is maybe ranking on the 10th page of Google, you don't have a good SEO. So SEO is just saying that you're going to use specific keywords so that your page mindscastlinrose.com is going to rank on the top page of Google. So that's basically what SEO is. Cause I know people are always like, what are you talking yeah. about? What, what is that? What are you talking about? Yeah. So and I, I can give like a real world example for your, uh, my YouTube videos would be, um, one of the most, and, and you can, their YouTube has their own like SEO tools that'll help you find, yeah. you know, the most searched topics. And if you want to get into this, you can, you can find it right off their website. Um, but uh, one of the most searched terms from an acting standpoint is just the like it's almost it's almost like um, like a duh of course that's the right that's the thing but um, sometimes you wouldn't think about it but it's just how to become an actor like that mm-hmm. that question itself is how is typed into YouTube um, I don't know what the exact numbers are but. It's the oh, most type, most searched question on YouTube uh, as far as an acting topic goes, right? So um, targeting that particular keyword is, and that's that's my most consistently watched video right now. 
I have other videos that will like have like will have big spurts like when I did the video on Black Widow like that got a lot of views initially but then after you know once Black Widow becomes like an older movie right now it's still kind of fresh so people are still watching that but I can see that that starting to dip down already but my video on how to become an actor has consistent uh a lot of views because it's ranking number one for that particular keyword when someone types in how to become an actor right yeah and um and I did do I mean we can get into like the nerdy stuff about <laughs> about like um the SEO for that because YouTube YouTube factors in a lot of things into their algorithm right in in terms of like the amount of the, the length of time that they watch and like how many likes you have on your videos, subscriptions gained from that video and the comments on it and things like that. Um, one of the things I did in that particular video that I thought was, I, I gave myself a pat on the back because I thought it was pretty smart. Um, <laughs> and and I, I've told other people to do it too, is that, you know, a lot of people in their videos, because YouTube does value comments, a lot of people will say, leave me a comment. Or even better than that, they will ask a question in the video. A call to action. And say, yeah, and, and exactly. It's a call to action and say, tell me in the comments what your favorite movie is or something like that, right? And then they'll do it in there. So in that video of uh, how to become an actor, in the early part of the video, and that's another important thing is to do it early because most people don't watch the video all the way to the end. And some people at the end will say, hey, like, comment, and subscribe in the last five seconds of the video. But most people have dropped off by then. So in the first few minutes of, of that video, I asked two questions. And I said, hey, what, um, what was the thing that made you want to become an actor? And number two, like, what, like um, what would be like your dream role as an actor? And I said, oh, and I also said, write those in two separate comments down there, right? So I got a lot of people that commented multiple times in there. That's brilliant. That one video has thousands and thousands of comments on it. And that's obviously it's just like, it continues to grow because of that, right? It's kind of like, um, it's just gained momentum and now it's just rolling down the hill and nothing's going to stop it until somebody makes an even more, you know, more engaging video, then that'll overtake it. And then I'll have to come up with something better. I think that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that information. And do you make all of your videos and do all of your editing on your on your own, or do you have a team? No, I do it myself, and it can get tedious. Um, but uh, but right now, I am doing everything on my own. Yeah, it's a process because sometimes I'm always like, "Gosh, I need to do more videos," and then I'm like, "Oh wait, I'm still editing the last three that I'm working <laughs> on," and it is quite time consuming. And, and do you edit your own podcast and everything too? I do. I do. And so that's why I was trying. So I'm using a new program right now. And it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a lot easier. Audio and video is supposed to sync. And it's supposed to be just a quicker process. And so hopefully it is but so far it has not been. So if if you guys did listen to my previous episodes, I was having some peaking issues. Mm. But I'm hoping that it is solved. I've been on I've been on the phone with uh, road all morning. And so I believe it should be all all fixed and set because I, I, I would I would like to to do this. And I used to create a lot of my own content, music videos, shorts, just stuff like that. And I would really, really love to get back into it. But right now I just I'm having a hard time juggling the podcast plus creating other stuff. And then, you know, your auditions and classes and jobs coming up. So, yeah, I would like to do something like that as well. And speaking of, um, I do have a photo shoot later because I am a photographer and I realized that, Kurt, you're a photographer as well. Did I research that correctly? Yeah. And that that was another, like that came through acting. I, mm. and it actually didn't start until I moved to Atlanta, honestly. I moved to Atlanta uh, in 2016. And when I decided to come down here, I convinced two of my other acting friends in Cleveland to also come down here. Um, hmm. I, well, I convinced them to come down and visit. I would didn't like twist their arm to move here, but I at least like yeah. convinced them to come visit with me. And then both of them decided, yeah, Atlanta does look like a good spot. Cause one of my friends was already like almost on his way out to move to LA at that point. Um, so when all three of us decided to come down here, we lived together for a couple years. Um, and while we were living together, you know, they were like, hey, we need new headshots, but we just moved and we're poor. And, you know, and we have this DSLR camera for self tapes. Why can't we take headshots with this camera? So 
I was like, okay, well, let's, we have time. So why don't we just go out there and play with the camera? So we would just go outside and take some pictures and practice. And was it like a rebel? It was, the uh, I think it was the ADD at that point. Uh, I think I would already I feel had, like everyone's, a lot of people's yeah. first cameras is the Canon Rebel series because yeah, they're cheap, the affordable, but they're still, yeah, yeah, but they're still really great. Yeah, so. they're definitely good. So, um, so I had that Canon ADD. We're taking some pictures, um, just like learning on our own. Um, and they were, they weren't great, but they were okay. Like they were actually like decent, I thought. So at that point I was like, okay, well, why don't I just kind of research? So that was, you know, that was YouTube. It was YouTube university for me. Of exactly. Just, like, learning photography, uh, and just watching tons and tons of photography videos. And, um, and then, so I kind of grew from there of, uh, uh, learning how to do stuff. And then I, I kind of grew my headshot photography business from that and just advertised to the people in my acting class at first and took their pictures. And then, you know, the headshot photography was kind of the, the good thing about it is you don't really have to market because your actors will do the marketing for you. Like mm -hmm. actors love posting their new headshots and sharing it with all their actor friends. So there, there's your, there's your marketing. Um, so it kind of, it, I was really grateful for that and it, it grew, um, really well up until everything stopped in 2020. And then I, I stopped taking, I stopped shooting in 2020 and I actually haven't started back up yet, partially because I've been making the YouTube videos and like doing all this. And that's been taking up a lot of my time and, and yeah. I've been really enjoying it. So now if I do have the time, I will go back to doing some more photography, but right now it's kind of on, on hiatus. I completely understand. Yeah, I looked at your photos and I was like, ooh, he's got like some nice like lighting and everything looks yeah. like really, really great. Thank and you. I think also that probably has helped with your YouTube videos because your YouTube videos look fantastic as well. And I was watching one, you were in a hotel room. I'm like, this looks fantastic. When you do self tapes um, and you're in a hotel room, do you bring all of your equipment and your stuff with you? No, I just rely on the window light, uh, yeah. just the natural light coming in. So you know, I'll get lucky like that. The one video that I made in the hotel room is just like, it was a nice bright day. Um, it looked great. Yeah. And, but, and, and same thing with self tapes, if it happens to be nice and bright and the light is even, it'll look great. But some of my hotel room self tapes have looked like garbage because I don't have consistent lighting uh, coming in. Like, you know, when, when like a cloud passes over the sun and all of a sudden the lighting changes, like, and then all of a sudden in the video, you would change color and everything like that. Um, but yeah. uh, I, I, I have looked into getting some like travel gear, but for the most part, I've been, I've made do with, uh, with just using natural light. Or if I'm in a city that actually has like self taping services, I'll oh, go to studio. somebody to, to tape for me. Sometimes, I mean, I've even done it on set. If I'm traveling because of work, then I'll tape something in my trailer. I'll just get another actor to come in there and, and read for me. And I've done that for other people too. I mean, we just, we make do, right? It's part of how it goes. Whoops. Oh, oh hey, uh, it's Castle, and it's just me interrupting my own podcast. So rude, I know. Well, I just wanted to let you know that Always Acting Up podcast is sponsored by We Audition. What's that? Well, it's the website for actors made by actors. It's the platform where you will never have to struggle to find an audition reader ever again. And the best part? You can be a reader, too, where you have the chance to read with real working actors, see what they're doing in their auditions, see what their setup looks like, all while practicing and getting better with your own cold reading skills. Oh, and did I mention, you can make money on there too. Say what? Well, I guess it might be time for you to check it out for yourself. But before you do, make sure to enter in my promo code, ACTINGUP25, for 25% off your subscription for a lifetime. That is ACTINGUP25, where we can hang out and help each other with our own auditions. See you on We Audition. Yeah. And I was curious really quickly, because you've made all these videos, they're like tutorials. Um, so his YouTube channel, if you're... He's got like dialect videos, how to start in the business, how to format your resume, everything about Actors Access. I've, I've seen all these videos. So if you have any questions, like head over to uh, Kurt's channel. It's uh, Acting Career Center on YouTube. You'll be able to get like all of the deets and all the information that you're looking for. Have you ever thought about creating your own like shorts and films now that you sort of have an idea of filmmaking on a, on a level of some oh. sort? I've, I've played with it a little bit, but it, um, not, no, not to any, not, not to, 
not as much as I think I would need to in terms of, um, uh, I guess, I guess my interest in it just isn't that high. Yeah, I've, I've played with it a little bit and I've dabbled in it, but there hasn't been anything where I've felt like, all right, yeah, I really need, I really need to tell this story. I really need to make this. I haven't gotten to that point yet. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's just a, I, I feel like it could definitely happen in the future because that's a different journey yeah. for everybody, right? A friend of mine just happened to work on an episode of Ozark. Um, uh, and mm. uh, she said uh, Laura Linney was directing the episode. And it happened to be her directorial debut. Like Laura Linney had never directed wow. anything. So, you know, she's been, you know, a working actor for ages. And now at this point in her career, like now is starting to, re- to direct. So, you know, it's a different journey for everybody. Totally. And so I'm really excited to ask you because, like I said, I was doing my research. I was browsing your YouTube page. Mm-hmm. You guys, Kurt... Uh, had a role in Marvel's Black Widow, and he recently just got to interview director uh, Kate Shoreland. How did that happen? Like, how did this happen? This is like the coolest thing ever. I totally agree with you. It's I, I think it's super cool. Um, I I just ha- I guess I had the idea when I um when I was making my videos and I started interviewing people. Cause I don't have a lot of interview videos up there. Most of them, it's just me talking, but, uh, I started interviewing some people and then I thought, um, part of the reason was that, you know, Kate was just so great and personable and amazing on set, uh, with everyone because we didn't like, I didn't have a huge role in the movie, but, and, and there have definitely been times on set on a movie set where, like the director never spoke to me, you know, they, they were just, they were doing their own thing and they had to spend all their time with the main characters. And I'm there as the day player and I go and do my job and then I'm gone. And I never even get to talk, you know, say a single word to the director. Whereas Kate yeah. happened to be, you know, super nice and welcoming and spent time with everybody really made them feel like they were a important part of the whole process. And uh, so that, at least made me feel confident where she would. And I don't necessarily know if she, I didn't know that that would have made her accept my interview, but at least I would have felt more comfortable talking to her in an interview setting. You know what I mean? Um, so that was part of the reason why I reached out. And um, and yeah, so I just decided to, if, you know, for those that don't know, if you have IMDb Pro, you can look anybody up on IMDb Pro and then see who their agents or managers or whoever, or who their publicists or anything like that. And that goes for directors and producers and everything too. And so I looked Kate up on IMDb. I saw who her manager was. There's an email address. I reached out to her manager after Black Widow came out and said, hey, I was an actor in this. I got to work with Kate, I had a great experience. I would love to interview her about Black Widow. Um, and then just gave them an out too. I was like, I totally understand. She's probably getting a million interview requests right now because Black Widow just came out. So if not, you know, just please pass along the message. I loved working with her and, uh, thank her for me. And that's it. And, uh, her manager would great reach, email me back like the next day and said, you're right. She's getting a ton of interview requests. I don't, I'm not dealing with this right now. Like Disney is handling all of their PR stuff. So I will forward your request to Disney and they will handle it. And I was like, okay, I'm probably never going to hear. It's going to go out into the ether now. Um, But then like three or four days later, like Kate emailed me back directly and said, Hey, yeah, what, when do you want to do this? Uh, So that was amazing. And I definitely, I was like, I just stared at my screen, like open mouth for a while uh, at, at her email. But, um, yeah, so that, that's how, that's how it happened. And then we just like, we found time and, uh, and, and did it via zoom. And I was definitely more nervous for the interview than I was to work on the movie. Uh, I was going to ask. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, in the, in, in the leading up to it. Right. But then once we kind of got started, it was the same. It was like, she was exactly how she was on set you know, just a very nice and welcoming and, and, and gracious person that, uh, who was easy to talk to. So as soon as we got it started, like 
I was calm and, and you know, it just felt like a normal conversation at that conversation. Point. Yeah, that, I mean, that's like, I saw that and I was like, Oh my gosh, because I get really nervous. Like I was nervous to reach out to you. I get nervous mm. to reach out to people like I've never met before. And I'm like, I know the most that they can say is no, but still like me and my little podcast that I get really nervous. And so I always have to just be like, okay, 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 just be confident, just be brave, just just reach out the most they can say is no. And I haven't had uh, the director of a Marvel film yet. But that's super exciting. Well, I think part of it, you know, is is that is the connection, right? That the fact, had I not been an actor on the movie, I don't think I would have gotten that interview, right? Because she wouldn't have known who I was, and they probably, you know, passed along the information to her. So that's something that I've been thinking about more and more. Of like, what a great way to then continue, because a lot of you know everybody talks about building relationships in this industry. And so yeah. what a great way to kind of continue to do that. Um, I'm going to now that that has happened one time, I'm going to continue to reach out to other mm-hmm. directors and actors and producers and other people that I uh, happen to get a chance to work with. And like you said, the worst they can say is no. But and I've had people say no, I've, I've definitely reached out to some yeah. people and they but they've been super nice about it, you know. Um, and uh, so I think it's something that a lot of actors could do. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to have a YouTube channel with 90,000 subscribers to do it. You can do one with a hundred subscribers. You, whatever it is, you have a platform and you Instagram just, lives. Exactly. Instagram lives, podcasts, whatever, and say, Hey, I do this podcast or I do this Instagram channel for actors or for whatever. And I interview people about the craft. And actually that's, this was something that was really cool about the, um, the interview was Kate um, was really nice and said that she was like, I loved this conversation because we got to talk about the craft. Whereas like the news media asking me about Black Widow aren't asking me Mm -hmm. these questions. Um, Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think it's a great way to continue to build relationships with other people within the industry. Yeah. One of the things I noticed while I was watching this interview, um, I like to watch people's faces and expressions while they're, (laughs) while they're watching (laughs) is it seemed like it was a really mutually respectful interview. Like it feels like it felt very comfortable. Like there wasn't any nerves. I felt like she was happy to be there. Um, I, I really enjoyed watching that, especially now knowing that you had to go through her publicist manager through Disney. I, I think that was really really wonderful for her to for her to do that and for the opportunity that you guys had that was fantastic yeah i'm super grateful and super thankful for her for taking that time with me and then even after we after we ended she spent like another like five minutes we were just chatting and then before you know she had to go so she was she was absolutely wonderful and you know and like i said like that was one of the things that gave me the confidence to reach out because she was definitely the same way on set as well and and we all know what it can like on a set can be very, um, it, it can be stressful, especially for the director, you know, and the d- director mm-hmm. is in charge of so much. And I, I was actually just listening to an interview um, with Ryan Coogler, uh, director of Black Panther, uh, yesterday or today, who knows what time is anymore. <laughs> um, I was, so oh, I was yeah. just listening to this interview and somebody had asked him the same question of, of uh, when he directed Black Panther, it's like, what was easier um, because you have, you know, you're now working on a big Marvel project. You've got tons of money, right? Uh, did that make things easier because you could now do whatever you wanted? Um, and the funny thing is, like, his answer was like, no, it actually made things harder. He said because when he had no budget, he knew exactly what he had to do with whatever time that he had, whatever amount of money that he had. But he's like, now I have almost unlimited money by Disney. I'm like, I don't, I, it, it almost makes things harder because there's, there's so much that's possible now. Um, so now thinking back to like how, and, and cause it was Kate Shortland's first big major project too. Um, thinking how, you know, stressful it must've been for her to be on that set and still be able to spend the time to make sure everybody else, you know, was comfortable and happy to be there. Uh, I was so you know, super happy to see that. And then, you know, that definitely made me comfortable to ask her. 
Yeah, it, it was a really great interview, you guys. I definitely check over, uh, head over to Kurt's channel and watch it because that was one of the things I was watching as well. I was like, did he know her beforehand? Like before you auditioned, did you guys have a relationship or some sort? But it was like, no, you you went and auditioned just like everybody else and you were formed this relationship. And then you got to have this interview and it does, it, you could tell that she is a good person and genuine like that because I, I've been on sets as well where... I was in my trailer and then they called me out and the director shook my hand. I went and did my my little couple lines like four times and they're like, thanks, bye. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm done. Okay, I, uh, thank you. Bye, see you later. So I was like, oh, that's really cool. That was fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> so cool. Well, um, before we wrap up with our moment of positivity, what do you think would be like the top three uh, things you would like to share with somebody who is looking to start a YouTube channel? I imagine they would be the same as a podcast. <laughs> I imagine they would be the similar things that, that you had probably shared in the past. Um, number one is just start. Uh, yes. You can look at any, you can look at my videos. You can look at anybody else who's a successful YouTuber and go to their first few videos and they're way worse quality than what they are now, right? So, oh yeah. Um, don't worry about trying to uh, try to be perfect. Uh, you know, a, a really good one is Joe Rogan. Like Joe Rogan's like one of the, main, the the most famous podcaster out right now. And and if you look at like his podcast, his video podcast on YouTube, and they're just what are they? Like he's just like talking to his friends, and, and they're they're mm -hmm. just goofing around. It's not really a, like what it is right now. So it's just just to start and and uh, and then learn as you go and learn as you grow, and uh, so that'd be number one. I think number two is to learn at least learn a little bit about the SEO stuff because that is going to be important to um, to grow your channel. Um, but what's interesting about YouTube too is is that it's different in SEO and whereas uh, compared to like Google SEO. Um, as, because web pages, you really have only one way to rank unless you're paying for ads, right? And to, to be ranked at the top of the page for ads, you can only rank um, based on the search. Whereas on YouTube, you have the search, but then you also have suggested videos. And then you also have the videos that show up at the end of another video. So there's all kinds of different ways to come up. So you don't necessarily have to rank um, via search. You can just make a video, like I said before, on, a sim on the same topic that I've already made a video on. And then if you're lucky, what will happen is when someone watches my video at the end of it, they'll suggest yours because it's on the same topic. Um, so that's a, that's another great way. So if you learn some of that stuff, at least, uh, enough to kind of get by, uh, that'll definitely help you get started. Um, and then, and the, the final one, I guess, and it's also, I guess all these things that kind of pertain to podcasting as well is like, don't worry yeah. about, don't try to talk to, like the world, um, pick, pick your like one ideal person and that's your audience and talk to that person because that's where kind of the imposter syndrome can definitely come into play. Like, Oh, but who am I to talk about this? Right. Cause I can, um, on the one hand, I can look at my resume like, Oh, I've been, I've got all these IMDB credits, but on the other hand, I could easily say, Oh, but I'm not an Oscar winner. I'm not an Emmy winner. Oh. Like I can't, <laughs> I can't talk about acting, right? So you can definitely have that imposter syndrome set in, but um, but I'm not talking to those people, right? Those people are at another level. I'm not trying to teach them anything. I'm trying to teach the people who are just getting started. So yeah, think about just that one person that you want to talk to and then make your videos for them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That was great. And so I am going to actually uh, transition us one more time into our moment of positivity. So Kurt, at the end of, uh, towards the end of every episode, I like to finish with a moment of positivity and uh, it could be a quote, words of wisdom, some advice, and uh, anything that kind of keeps you going during those hard days. I would be absolutely honored if you had anything to share with us. I would imagine someone's probably already said this, uh, especially in the last year, but my advice is watch Ted Lasso. That's my positivity. <laughs> I haven't, no one said that. I actually 
Nope. I haven't heard that one before. Have you seen it? No. That will no. be that will be all the positive positivity you will need for the entire year. Uh, okay. Season one of Ted Lasso is one of the most perfect seasons of television I've ever seen. And okay. the fact that it came out during the pandemic when, you know, people were feeling very down, it was the perfect thing for to uplift people um, because the show and the main character are just so positive. And it's, uh, it's a fantastic show. Uh, if you don't have Apple TV, at least sign up for the seven day free trial and just binge season one. Um, you okay. will not, you will absolutely not regret it. Um, and they're and season two is currently out. Um, I think they're about halfway through. So that is my, my positivity recommendation is to watch Ted Lasso. You will feel uplifted as soon as you see it. Absolutely. Just my YouTube channel. Honestly, that's what I uh, use the most. I'm on um, like Facebook and Instagram, but I really don't use those very much. And I typically could keep my Facebook to my friends and family and then Instagram. I'm just not on there enough. Uh, so my YouTube channel is the way to go. And then you can definitely feel free to leave comments on any of my videos. I try to answer as many questions as I can on uh, in the comment section. So um, yeah, find me on there. Comment section, you guys. Comment section, comment section of the actors. Why do I keep forgetting? I know this. <laughs> acting, acting Career Center channel. You can get a hold of Kurt Yu. Say hello. Ask all those questions. Scroll through all those videos. It'll answer like pretty much any question you have. And any questions you do have that you don't have those answers, maybe there'll be a video in the future. So thank you so much. Um, and of course, I'm going to do a little plug now that I know I probably should have done this plug at the beginning of my podcast, but make sure to like, follow and subscribe to Always Acting Up podcast found on all podcasting platforms. And of course, we are here on YouTube as well. I also got the new Instagram Always Acting Up podcast on the gram. And I think that should be all. Anything else you'd like to share with us, Kurt, before we uh, enjoy the rest of the day? No, this has been fun. Thank you so much for having me, Kasim. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to release this one. And you guys, enjoy the rest of your day. Where's my music? Can you hear the music at all? No, I don't hear any music. Oh, I don't think you hear it on your end. It's always on my end.